All right, guys, this is part one of the 2013-14 Connerland WAP review. Uh, it's time to lock it down and get ready to go. we got about two weeks to this test, so this is obviously not your only study guide or study resource, but it should help you out along the way. Like I said, this is part one, hopefully not too many, but uh, here we go. As we go through this, you're going to notice there are six different periods. We've talked about them throughout the year, and you need to be very aware of the events that happen both within each individual period and also the events that... Uh, kind of go across multiple periods. Uh, we're going to begin here with beginnings to 600 BCE. First thing we're going to deal with is the very first thing that we did in class this year, and that's the Neolithic Revolution. Uh, the main features that you need to know, first of all, it's a watershed moment. It's something that completely changes the game. It completely changes the course of human history. In the fact that for the first time, people didn't have to go chasing their food. Their lives weren't uh, determined by the migrations of animals uh, throughout the year. So for the first time, you could stay in one place and grow crops. And that's all the Neolithic Revolution means, is that for the first time, you can deliberately plant seeds and harvest crops. And it happens in several places across the world during this time period. Uh, more, most specifically, the River Valley civilizations, of which we have the Nile Valley, uh, the Indus Valley, which is in South Asia or India. We have the Yellow River Valley in East Asia or China and uh, the Nile River Valley in Egypt. So you need to know those locations on a map as well as what this is. Uh, some of the features of it. Number one, it did not occur globally at the same time. It diffused itself or it sprang up in different spots um, as we go throughout this time period. Number two, it also concerns not only the planting of seeds and harvesting of crops, but also the domestication of animals um, for, for personal use. In other words, you're taming animals to be able to use them for your end purpose or go. Number four, I guess, on the list here is technological developments. And um, you've got to remember, guys, uh, during this time period, technological developments, we're not talking computer chips, we're not talking anything like that. I mean, technological developments are anything that makes something easier um, or more efficient. In other words, something that pushes the process forward. And in this time, the main thing that life was centered around was agriculture. So your technological developments center around agriculture. Uh, things like making new plows or sickles or just ways to put seeds in the ground or, or take plants out of the ground. Uh, next on our list is population growth. you got to be able to trace this, okay? More food equals people live longer. They have more children that survive, so it equals an explosion in population. And that's going to lead to uh, cities and civilization that we'll talk about here in a second. Also, we have the uh, specialization of labor and the fact that uh, for the first time, people don't have to simply farm for a living. Uh, you're producing enough food, you have enough of a surplus where people can uh, now uh, perform other tasks, perform other jobs. They can be uh, warriors, they can be scribes, they can be religious leaders, whatever it is, anything that doesn't have to do with agriculture. So, you know those key features and because they, they play a big deal in things that we talk about going forward. Next thing on our list is the features of early urban societies. Now, here's basically the way it works out. Uh, you, once uh, the Neolithic Revolution happens, you begin to see agricultural settlements. And as these settlements get bigger, they begin to be kind of the markings of civilization. And one of the key components of civilization is cities. And that's what we're talking about here, the early cities that we have in human history. Uh, some of the features or characteristics of it. Uh, number one, you have political and religious leaders. And at this time, these guys are pretty intertwined to the point where, uh, in a lot of cases, they're the same person. Uh, you also have legal codes, such as the Code of Hammurabi or the Code of the Assyrians that we looked at at the first of the year. Uh, you need to be able to think about those in the context of how they differentiated between social hierarchies. In other words, were the punishments the same for people at the top of the chain and, were, and at the bottom of the chain? Also, uh, you now see the development of a common language, and that's just simply from people living together in the same place and having to use it to conduct everyday business. Now, in these early urban centers, you also see the rise of the first literature recorded in human history. And uh, some of the ones that we've talked about throughout the year are the Epic of Gilgamesh from Mesopotamia, the Book of the Dead from Egypt. And uh, one of the commonalities or the common themes that you see through these works is that it deals with, uh, in some cases, life, but in a lot of cases, the afterlife, and a lot of questions that humanity has. Now, in dealing with the world as well, you do have these cities or these agricultural settlements, but on the flip side of that or on the other side of it, you also have pastoral nomads or pastoralists as we'll call them. And these are the guys who are still herding their animals. They live around the patterns of, uh, of their herds, of their uh, horses, whatever it is. And uh, the main role that these guys played during this time period is that they were, I think I said in class, diffusers of technology, um, technology goods and ideas. Basically what they did is they took these things from city to city or settlement to settlement, whatever you want to call it, and they did it through a couple of ways. One might be through trading, uh, because pastoralists are not able to produce the goods 
um, that people in cities have. In other words, it might be weapons. It might be uh, things to work with their animals. It might be clothing. Just no matter what it is, it's things that they can't produce themselves. So they're trading, in some cases, these things back and forth. Uh, when they do that, they go to the next place and they talk about the cities that they visited. So that's where you kind of get the exchange of ideas and the technology as well. Um, also, sometimes this is done through raiding. They would go in and attack a settlement or a city, as we're calling them, and uh, whatever they looted or whatever they took out of it, they would then take to the next place as well. So just know that these guys were kind of the transmitters of technology, goods, and ideas during this time period. Uh, you also see uh, during this period with relation to uh, urban societies is that the developments of religions, and I'm talking about organized religions here, and the first two that we need to concern ourselves with are Hinduism and Judaism, and you need to know the characteristics of both of them. I'm not going to spend any time here doing it, uh, but you have the list, look over it, and know the basics of it. So that wraps up our uh, period one review. Uh, it's the least, I don't want to say least important, but the least focused upon uh, period on the AP exam. Uh, so you've got a list of the main things, so we're going to roll on to the next one, and that's period two, which is from 600 BCE to 600 CE, and we start to see a lot of things develop and pick up during this time period. First thing we're going to talk about with uh, period two is the fact that some of the faiths that were developed during period one begin to develop a little bit during this time period. And the two that we're talking about obviously are Judaism and Hinduism. And uh, they're developing. They're like evolving over time. There's different components added to it such as the caste system with Hinduism um, and things related to that. It'd also be a good time to note that uh, Hinduism is a polytheistic religion. We've talked about that plenty throughout the year. And Judaism is a monotheistic uh, religion. So, as far as the components and things, you already should know that, but you need to know during the beginning of this time period, they begin to spread a little bit, and particularly uh, the Jewish religion. And it's spread through, or spread by merchants who are going to major trade cities throughout the Mediterranean. So, it's not on a global scale or anything like we would think about now. It's relatively regional, but um, it's the first time that this begins to happen. And uh, once again, with Ju uh, Hinduism and the caste system, with the features of Hinduism, uh, know those along with that chart that you see right there. So we've got our already existing belief systems from the first period. Now we begin to add a couple more to it. And we're going to add one more as we go along, but we're not there yet. Uh, new, new belief systems during this period are Buddhism and Christianity, two of the major ones that we've studied throughout the year with the way that they have impacted or, um, or you know, uh, done things to the societies where they exist. Uh, once again, as far as the characteristics, not going through them. You've got that in front of you. But you need to know the basics of Buddhism and Christianity. Not all the specifics of it, but be able to tie it in. Next, and probably most importantly for our purposes, is how did these religions spread? And you can see there's a couple maps on here that we've looked at in class of how Buddhism and Christianity spread. And um, there's a couple ways in which this happens. Number one, you've got missionaries, and number two, merchants. Um, tying it in, if you look at the map right here, the proliferation, proliferation of Buddhism right here, know that it starts in India and it makes its way along the Silk Road. That's the key feature of the spread of Buddhism during this time, is that it spreads through merchants along the Silk Road. Christianity is kind of along the same thing. It goes along the Roman road network, which you can see right here, uh, as it spreads. Um, the original intent of the Roman road system, and the Silk Road for that matter, was not to spread religions. It's just a byproduct of that process. And the uh, Roman road in particular was built uh, to get goods and, more importantly, troops throughout the Roman Empire. But as we go forward and Christianity begins to spread, it's a you know, it's an ideal highway to be able to do this and spread the message of both faiths to new people as they spread. Now we shift over to East Asia for a second and look at two things that are not considered religions, they're considered philosophies. And we're talking about Confucianism and Taoism. Um, as far as Confucianism goes, it was developed, like a lot of things, out of chaos. China during this time period is going through something called the Warring States period. And there needs to be some kind of order and some kind of uh, hierarchy, I guess you could say, to society. And that's what ends up happening uh, when Confucius comes out with these ideals or this philosophy. Uh, some of the key features you need to know with regards to it are, number one, the Analects are the collected writings of Confucius and kind of the wisdom and the way that he tells people to go about their lives. Uh, filial piety is another one, which is respect for mothers, fathers, grandmothers, family members, in other words, elders, if you want to look at it like that. And also uh, patriarchy, which means uh, it's a male-dominant society. They're the ones at the head of the household. They're the ones at the top of the government. Uh, Confucianism, one of the main things with it is that it set up a parallel between family structure and government structure and the fact that in a family you have a father who is the head of household and in the government uh, you have an emperor who is the head of the nation, country, whatever you want to call it. Well, the same principles and the same responsibilities um, are, you know, are parallel in these two relationships. So the people under kind of have the same roles and responsibilities when it comes to the people above them. 
Uh, it also wouldn't be a bad idea to be able to tie ancestor worship into Confucianism as well. In other words, you have reverence for your ancestors. You worship them. You feel like, um, and I'll talk about this here in a second, but you know, you do things in your life to please them. That way your life will go well. Uh, Taoism is the next. We've talked about that, the yin and yang, the harmony, the nature, and all that things, all those things that go into it. Uh, for our purposes, the two of the main things is the influence on medicine and architecture. With medicine, we're talking things like acupuncture, uh, restoring balance to the body using Eastern healing methods and things like that. They're a little bit different than what we have now. And uh, with the architecture, if you can recognize this building right here and the style of architecture that it has, you should be good when it comes to the Taoist influence on East Asian architecture. So now we move out of, uh, I guess, what we'll call the core civilizations of this era and move to places outside of it and look at their religion. And um, we're talking places like Southeast Asia, the Indian region of South America, and, uh, and other places like that, kind of outside of where we're talking about. And the two main ones that dominate during this time are animism and shamanism. And the, the thing that these things have in common is that they have a, a core belief in ancestor worship, which I talked about a while ago. It's um, kind of your ancestors, the people who have passed before you, are guiding your life. And they go about this in a couple of ways. Animism focuses on the natural world, or nature spirits, and the fact that they have powers that can influence and shape daily life. Shamanism is a little bit different where, well, it's not really different. It's got the same component, but you're using a go-between. You're using a middleman to get there, and that guy is called a shaman. So. He's a person who can uh, be a contact between this world and the spirit world and talk to these ancestors. So be aware of them. They're, uh, they're outside of kind of the focus area of this unit, but no less important. All right, so now we move on to the actual empires that we'll be talking about in this period. And these are called must-know empires for a reason. You're going to need to know who they were and where they were located because you might see them on a map. So I'm going to kind of briefly highlight uh, the best I can using this program where these places are. The first one is, and I'm going to, kind of, going to go kind of slow on this so you know, the first one is the Persian Empire, which is located roughly in here. So if you see something highlighted on the map from this region, that's where they're talking about. Next on the list are the South Asian or Indian empires of the Gupta and Mauryan, which will be, as we know, located right here with India. Then we move to East Asia, which once again equals China, and we look at the Qin and the Han. So anything over in here is going to be the Qin and the Han during this era. Next we move over to uh, Europe, particularly Southeast Europe for this time period, uh, with the different empires. And the first one on the list, and this is going to be kind of hard to see on this, and I apologize for it, guys. Uh, but the first one is the Phoenician Empire, which is right here located in what is currently known as the Middle East. And the Phoenicians are uh, known for their trade practices and colonies. Uh, next is going to be the Greek city-states, which is located right here, places like Sparta and Athens. Uh, then we go to Alexander the Great's Hellenistic Empires, which will kind of spread, and we'll look at this one in class, will spread kind of all over the place as it goes. Uh, next on the list are the Roman Republic and Roman Empire, which are centered in Italy, and obviously they spread throughout the place. We'll look at the progressive maps or change over time maps of how they spread uh, in class as well. And uh, lastly, as far as the Mediterranean region goes, one that we haven't focused on a lot this year, but the Byzantine Empire might be on there as well. In the center of it is going to be modern-day Turkey, which is right here located to the west of Greece. Moving to the other side of the globe with the Western Hemisphere for the first time for a little bit uh, as far as this review goes. You've got two, uh, I guess you could call them empires or city-states that are located uh, on this side of the globe during this time period. And the first one is the T.S. uh which I am sure I butchered that pronunciation, but that's okay, which is going to be located roughly in the southern part of Mexico into Central America. And then the uh, Mayan city-states, which are located roughly in the same region. And then in Andean South America, when you see that referred to, you're talking about anything roughly around the Andes Mountains, around the western coast of South America. And we've got the Mochi Empire there as well. So if you can identify these things on the map, you should be okay as far as, um, as the basics of these empires. But these are the ones that you'll be responsible for. And it looks like I'm running out of time, so that's going to wrap up part one of the review. Many more to come, as you can see. Thanks for sitting through it. Uh, keep on working, man. We'll get there eventually.